Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, and I'm here to talk to you about a new Karkara dontosaur coming from Uzbekistan. Before I get straight into that, I do want to mention some of the geologic context that was happening, especially with some of the animals around this time. And that's because the Karkara dontosaurs were actually pretty dominant throughout large parts of the Cretaceous, especially the early Cretaceous. But this is important for this new animal because it was one of the last Karkara dontosaurs to have ever lived and it lived during the early part of the late Cretaceous, which is important for reasons that I will get into later. But also it's important because after this time period where the Karkar dinosaurs started to die out, the Tyrannosaurs became much, much more dominant. And that's where we get famous animals like Tyrannosaurus rex, which lived all the way at the very end of the Cretaceous. So the Tyrannosaurs really only had a few million years compared to some of these other groups of absolute dominance in their environments. The new Karkar dinosaur, Ulubegsaurus uzbekistanensis, was actually a lot smaller than a lot of the earlier Carcardonosaurus as well. Some of them, like Carcardonosaurus, could actually reach up to 40 feet in length, or potentially even larger, rivaling the size of Tyrannosaurus rex. However, this animal was much smaller, probably at around 26 feet in length, so a little bit under 10 meters. So this animal was far from being one of the largest Carcardonosaurus ever found, even though some news articles did say that it was potentially even larger than Tyrannosaurus rex, especially by like such a large margin that's just completely unfeasible. It was, however, larger than the Tyrannosaur that would have lived in its environment, and that's Timurlengia. Timurlengia is actually a really good example of what some of the Tyrannosaurs were like before the extinction of the Carcardonosaurs, when they could finally grow to these massive sizes and start to dominate environments. And that's because it was relatively small, potentially only being around 4 meters in length, or about 12 feet. So they definitely weren't the massive behemoths that we normally think of when we think of the name Tyrannosaur. And as for the importance of these two species living together, a large part of that importance comes from their very late occurrence in the Cretaceous, at least relative to the other Carcardonosaurs. And that's because they came in the Turonian stage of the Cretaceous, which is essentially just a subsection of the Cretaceous. This occurrence in the Turonian is also pretty much equal with when we see the last occurrences of Carcardonosaurs on other continents as well. And that's because in South America, there's no evidence of them beyond the Turonian. And the last known occurrence of a Carcardonosaur in North America comes from just before the Turonian, and that's with the animal Siats. It's also important because this is the last known co-occurrence of Tyrannosaurs and Carcardonosaurs in the same environment. There's a few other places where there's animals that are either Carcardonosaurs or relatives of Carcardonosaurs that would have been living alongside one another. However, this is the very last one, and potentially some of the reasons that they did go extinct pretty much simultaneously may have been due to this kind of co-occurrence because the Tyrannosaurs may have essentially hunted them out and into extinction. Now, I've already mentioned that Timurlengia was much smaller than Ulubixaurus, but there's been a lot of recent research that has been really useful for showing that in Tyrannosaur-dominated environments, there weren't really a lot of mesopredators, and mesopredator just means that it's a mid-sized predator. So if you think of the African savanna, the lion would be the apex predator, it would be the largest predator in that region. And then you would go all the way down with a bunch of smaller mesopredators. What we find instead in many of the tyrannosaur dominated formations is that instead you would essentially have that equivalent to a lion and then the relatively sized next largest carnivore would be the size of a bat-eared fox. So there's a ton of diversity that's missing relative to other environments in tyrannosaur dominated environments. And a large part of that is probably because the tyrannosaurs were essentially out hunting them when they were juveniles. And so what that means is the juvenile Tyrannosaurs started to fill in a lot of these predatory niches that mesopredators would have originally filled. And this could potentially even be some other reason for the extinction of the Carcardonosaurs, because essentially they wouldn't be able to compete with even some of the juvenile and smaller Tyrannosaurs when the Carcardonosaurs themselves were also juveniles. And so they may have just died out simply due to that pressure specifically. Now to be fair, that's not a completely confirmed hypothesis because geologically and even climatically, there's still a lot of change happening during the Middle Cretaceous. So it could have also just been that the environments were not very favorable to the Carcardonosaurs, and so they died out for other reasons. But all we can really say for sure is this is the last time that a Carcardonosaur and a Tyrannosaur were living alongside each other, at least that we know of. And so something might be able to be found from there with further research. And this paper actually starts some of that other research, first by trying to find out which other animals Ulubegsaurus would have been closest related to. And that's actually really hard to do because it's pretty partial. It's essentially just a maxilla bone, which is one of the skull bones that would have had some teeth and it's pretty broken up already. So you can see how it's pretty hard to try and tell what animals it would have been related to. 
especially since normally in a lot of these experiments, they run multiple tests with multiple different data sets to try and understand where the animal shows up the most often. And they did that with this paper too, running multiple data sets to try and figure out what it was. And the first test put it in Neovenator NA, which is actually pretty odd because it contains a lot of the Megaraptorans, but they did place this group as a subfamily of Carcharodontosauridae, so it does still fall within the Carcharodontosaurs. However, the other group that most of the Megaraptors are normally placed in are the Silurosaurs, so things that are closer to the Tyrannosaurs, Raptors, and a lot of other things. And the second test actually did place those animals over on that side of the phylogram. However, what's important is that Ulubegsaurus still stayed with the Carcharodontosaurs, so it's pretty definitively a Carcharodontosaur, at least with our current testing methods. Now, it's still really hard to tell which of the Carcharodontosaurs it would have been most closely related to, and that's largely because whenever you see a vertical line in one of these phylogenetic trees, and all the branches are coming off at the same point, that means any pairing of those animals is just as equally likely as any other pairing. So essentially, statistically, there's no way to tell which of those animals is most closely related. So with our very limited data sets that we have for some of these animals, this is really all we can say right now is that there's a distinctive group, but we don't really know which ones are most closely related in that group. However, even with that said, we can still say that Ulubexaurus was still not the most massive Carcharodontosaur in the world. But since it wasn't the Tronian, it was one of these last lasting species. And so hopefully we can try and understand more about what it was doing behaviorally, eventually at least, so we can try and understand why the Tyrannosaurs were able to essentially become more dominant and why the Carcharodontosaurs died out and left the Tyrannosaurs so much free real estate.